Hey guys, this is Steve Qureshi, and today I want to talk to you guys about the enumeracy bias and problems in statistical thinking. So our story begins in the early 1970s with the work of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. And uh, these are two behavioral economists who originally discovered uh, what we now call cognitive biases. And the very first cognitive bias they discovered was the enumeracy bias. Now, the enumeracy bias refers to our natural inability to cognitively process and evaluate ratios, probabilities, and orders of magnitude. So essentially what they discovered was that human beings, just using their intuitions, are very, very bad at evaluating probabilistic concepts. Uh, in other words, with just using their kind of ballparking sense of what's going on in a situation, uh, we're naturally just not designed to think in terms of probabilities or statistics. Now, if, if that's true, uh, which it, you know, it, it's been pretty strongly established that it is true, that leads us to a lot of problems for poker. Because obviously in poker, we, we really need to do statistical thinking. We do it, we try to do it all the time. So uh, for example, let's say that you're in a, a live game and you get three bet by somebody, you, know, you raise, he three bets you, and uh, you have to decide now, how much do I think this person is three-betting me? So if, if you are, uh, let's say there are probably about two ways, I would say, that, that you can really evaluate how much you think this person is three-betting you, right? You don't have a how, you don't have stats. Uh, all you really have is your intuition. So uh, if you think about it, how are you making that decision? One way would be you kind of look at him and you sort of think to yourself, uh, do I think this guy is really three-betting? Do I feel like he's a really aggressive three-better, or do I feel like he's kind of uh, tight, passive, right? There, what you're really doing is you're just kind of consulting your attitude about it. You're just kind of thinking about what is my overall just general perception of this person, uh, but you're not really looking at the actual events of three-bet, and you're not making any kind of ratios. You're clearly not doing anything like that. And when you're doing something like that, it's very clear you're not going to be able to make a distinction between something like an 8% three-betting frequency or a 14% three-betting frequency, which in terms of actual ranges and in terms of frequencies is a pretty big difference that matters a lot in an actual poker strategy. But just thinking like that isn't going to get you there. Um, so the, the other alternative, which you might think you have, is well, consulting your memory, right? Uh, maybe what you would do is you would look at this person and you would think to yourself, okay, what are all the hands that this guy's three bet me in the past? And um, <clears throat> you might think if you're actually thinking that discreetly, then maybe you will have a good read on how much the guy's three bet you. But the, the problem with that is that it relies on a certain framework or a certain belief about how memory functions. And in fact, that assumption about memory is quite wrong. So most of us believe that our memory kind of works like a, you might say like a video camera, uh, that sort of we record everything that's going on out there in the world, and then when we wanted to see what's happened in the past, we sort of kind of rewind the internal VCR and started watching it reverse, and then we just sort of see all the hands that we've been three bet, and that's how we presumably would see all the, you know, our, consult our memory. That's not how memory works. That's not at all how memory works. Uh, in fact, memory works more kind of like, uh, it works more kind of, it's kind of like keeping a journal, you might say, in that when you're keeping a journal, some things are mentally overrepresented. Um, you know, you, you, you write down things in a journal based on how important they were to you the end of the day. You don't write down everything. Uh, and you write down generally the things that are very emotional get affected by the way in which they're emotional. So for example, if you're playing, uh, if you've been playing somebody a lot, if if you recently played a hand with them where they three bet you and they took a lot of money off you, or let's say this guy has just recently been talking trash to you, uh, then you're much more likely to think that his three betting frequency is very high because you're associating all these emotional concepts and they're congealing into your idea of this person in your memory. So basically what that means is that memory is fundamentally unreliable. Memory gets tainted by the stuff around it. And so even just consulting your memory of what specific times you've been three bet, you're not going to get an accurate read on this person. You're not going to get a, you're not going to be able to read it fine enough to make subtle gradations between eight percent, twelve percent, sixteen percent.
So where does that leave us? If, if all that is true, and all the scientific evidence suggests that it is true, what can we do? I mean, we have to make those kinds of decisions in poker. So what, what's the way out of, how do we make good probabilistic inferences in poker? If we have this numeracy bias, if memory is unreliable, if our just, you know, base intuitions or slices of people when we perceive them, if those are unreliable, what are our options? And uh, I would suggest, actually, that the one most valuable antidote to the problems of enumeracy is what I call statistical or probabilistic rigor. Now, probabilistic rigor is, it's a very simple idea. And it's one that when I say to you, you might even be tempted to say that you already do it. Probabilistic rigor is simply every time you get into any kind of situation in poker, every time you can come down to a decision about your opponent, uh, to always assign a probability to everything that you see. So for, let's, let's paint an example. Let's say that you're in a hand with somebody pre-flop, and uh, you raise him, he, he three bets you, you call. Uh, he, you check to him, he bets a flop, you call, you turn comes down something, you check the turn, he bets, you check raise, and, and well, for now we'll just end the hand there. So, if you're thinking probabilistically, uh, prob sorry, if you're thinking probabilistically rigorously, then uh, what you'll do is, is pre-flop when this guy pre-bets you, you'll say, okay, I think he's pre-betting me about 12% of the time. And so then you call, and the flop comes down, a certain flop, you check it to him, he bets. And you think to yourself, okay, I think he's betting this flop about 70% of the time. And then you go in and call, turn comes down, whatever, you check to him, you think he's going to bet. 40% uh, of the time, you check raise him, and then you think, okay, I think he's going to fold to this 50% uh, of the time, he's going to call 35% of the time, and he's going to shove 15% of the time, or whatever it is, right? That is basically the application of probabilistic rigor. Now, you don't, you don't do that, right? You know in your heart of hearts that you don't actually do that. You might think that, yes, I do think in terms of probabilities, but clearly you don't assign probabilities every single hand on every single spot. Uh, and in fact, none of us do that. That's not, there's no poker player who actually does that that rigorously. Um, but my, my point is to say that if you did do that, if you were that thorough with your, uh, with your application of uh, probabilities, if you were actually forcing yourself to do that every single hand on almost every single street, then you would develop your sense of probability much, much faster, and you would be making better decisions on almost every street. And here's why. Uh, I think there are, uh, I'd say there are probably four main reasons why, if you were thinking this way, if you were actively applying probabilities at every possible spot, um, why this would make you into a much better poker player. Uh, for one, if you are actively applying probabilities all the time to your opponent, then you are allowing yourself to get more and more attuned to the subtle gradations between probabilities, right? If you're never really thinking that, that closely, except in, let's say, really tough spots where you're thinking, okay, do I want to shove or not in a you know, pre-flop four betting game, maybe then almost everybody thinks in terms of probabilities, right? We, we, we force ourselves to consult that notion uh, when we get in a spot that's that severe, that important, whatever. But if you were doing it all the time, right, then it would make you think more, more often, about what really is the difference, just intuitively, between an 8% three better and a 12% three better. It would force you to name that difference. It would force you repeatedly to pay closer and closer attention and to calibrate yourself by assigning those probabilities, right? If you're not doing that, if you're simply just kind of letting hands wash over you and not uh, actively trying to interpret them probabilistically, then of course you're not going to be able to make those distinctions. Of course you're not going to be able to say, that's a 12% three better, that's a 14% three better, that's an 18% three better, because you've, you're not practicing making those distinctions. The, the information is coming to you, but it's just kind of going out the other ear. Uh, but if you're forcing yourself to always kind of commit yourself to probabilistic um, inferences. That doesn't necessarily mean you're always going to be right. Of course you're not, right? And uh, in many situations, you may not even be able to check whether or not your probabilistic inferences are correct. 
so if you're saying, I think this guy's going to be winning about 8%, I think this guy's going to be winning about 12%, um, in a lot of situations, you might not be able to prove that that's right. But you know, there are many instances in which you can prove it's right. Like, for example, let's say uh, you know, you're trying to pin someone on a, three, on a preflop, uh, or so let's say you're trying to pin someone on a flop C betting range, and you're saying, I think he C bets about this amount. But then you see him C bet, uh, you know, A7 on, uh, you know, 974. And uh, then you, you say, okay, well, then I know that at least he's C betting A7 and up, right? And so you can make that inference, which tells you the minimum amount that he must be C betting, and you can calibrate based off of that. You can, you can use that information to say, okay, I know he's at least C betting this much. So if I thought he was C betting less, then I, can, I know that that's not true and I'm getting some feedback there. Um, now, and, or for example, if you're playing on a site that doesn't allow HUDs, you might be able to look over some hand histories afterwards, even if you don't have a HUD, and check some of your inferences and see, okay, well, I thought he was three betting me this amount, he's actually three betting me this much. I can, you know, you can calibrate that way. But even if you can't calibrate, even if you don't have that perfect feedback to tell you what was absolutely right and what was absolutely wrong, you're still going to get better just because you're paying more attention and trying to call those shots. That alone is going to make you better at making those probabilistic inferences. So that's, that's I think, is, is, is the first advantage. Now, the second advantage to probabilistic thinking is that it discourages us from thinking in absolutist terms. Uh, or in other words, it, it tries to prevent all or nothing type thinking. Uh, so that's basically when you decide that somebody has one hand and that's what he has, so that's what I have to do, right? And, as poker players, we kind of know, or you know, if you've been playing poker for a while, if you're not a beginner, uh, chances are you you might even think that I well, I don't think in absolutist terms. I do understand that you know poker is probabilistic. Like I have to assign uh, certain percentages to the chance that he's bluffing or that he's value betting. Right? We we kind of most most advanced players or you know even intermediate players are well aware of that at this point. Uh, but in reality, all poker players, no matter how good or bad sometimes think in absolutist terms. I don't care how good you are, you do sometimes think in absolutist terms. Um, I think some of the most uh, prevalent examples of this for most poker players are in hero call situations, but I would say even most of all in uh, actually a lot of bluffing situations, right? Uh, let's say I'm in a situation where I am check-raising somebody on the river, and I know that he always has at least a bluff catcher. So he always has something he can at least call with. So my check raise isn't a question of how often do I think he's bluffing here so I can get him off a bluff. The question is only how often do I think he's going to call. And if you think about it, if you really, if you really consult yourself in these kinds of spots, I would say that most people end up thinking, is he going to believe me or not? That's what they think. Is he going to believe me or is he not going to believe me? And if he calls, then our inference, generally speaking, is he was going to believe me, therefore the bluff was bad. And if he folds, then we think he wasn't going to, or he was, uh, or sorry, he wasn't going to believe me, therefore the bluff was bad. And if he folds, then he wasn't going to believe me and the bluff was good, right? We, we sort of automatically engage in this all or nothing type thinking, especially if the pot is sufficiently big. Um, forcing yourself to think in probabilistic terms, like it, it stamps out a lot of those absolutist tendencies. And it, it lets you to think, okay, well, if in reality your check, you know, you think he's calling that river uh, when you when you check raise with his bluff catcher fifty percent of the time, and then folding fifty percent, and you're you know check raising two thirds pot or something, right? Uh, then you're giving yourself good odds. In the, then it is a plus even play. You're giving yourself good odds. And but if he does call, you don't necessarily know that you made a bad play, because you assign yourself a 50% probability of him folding. So if that's true, if you're an absolutist and you get in that spot, uh, then you're kind of screwed. You, there's, you just made a bad play. There's no, there's no redemption from that, right? You, you made the wrong play, you lost all that money, it's all your fault. You get all this negative mental conditioning uh, that tells you this is a bad play, that's it, game over, right? But if you are assigning probabilities in that situation, and you make that check raise and it fails, yeah, that's, that's some evidence that you made a bad play, but it's not decisive evidence that you made a bad play. It may still have been a good check raise bluff. And in, in reality, that is actually a very good thing, that the mental conditioning you get is not so severely negative 
that it restricts you from ever wanting to make plays like that again. So this, I think, is the third advantage of probabilistic thinking, is that it allows you, actually, to take more risks. It allows you to make more intelligent, thoughtful uh, bluffs, or uh, you know, to, to get into situations where, normally, if you fail a play, your mental condition will be, don't do that play, don't be creative, don't get out of line, right? If you're an absolutist, this is what your brain is going to tell you. But if you're thinking probabilistically, this allows you much more freedom. It allows you much more creativity. And that, I think, is supremely important to learning. That's so, so important to learning. Because it allows you to really explore the landscape of poker and see what works, what doesn't. It allows you to make similar kinds of bluffs on different people without thinking, okay, well, this bluff never works because I tried it once on this guy and that one failed. If you're an absolutist, you're going to be frozen. You're going to be paralyzed from making those kinds of plays. But if you're a probabilistic thinker, you're going to have much more latitude in how you explore risky and creative plays, which really is the biggest difference between really, really great players and, I think, uh, decent players. So now the fourth advantage, and I think this is a quite big one, actually, is that it allows you, and it's kind of parallel to the previous one, it allows you to traverse things like fear, like the belief that somebody is fundamentally better than you. Uh, like the belief that uh, you know, you're, you're not good enough. Um, if you're actually applying probabilities, if you're saying, I think this guy's going to fold 20%, I think he's going to call 80%, right? If you, if you do that, if you commit yourself to that, then you can't say, oh, this guy's just better than me, therefore I'm not going to make plays, right? You're disallowed from saying that. If you're an absolutist and you just look at somebody and you think he's a really great player, then you're just going to be paralyzed. You're just not going to want to make a move. You're not going to want to... Uh, extend yourself. But if you're, if you're assigning probabilities actively all the time, then you have no excuse not to make that check raise because if you believe that he's, uh, or I guess if he's calling 80%, if that's what I said, then you should just be not bluffing and evaluating a lot, right? That is the adjustment you have to make because as soon as you assign probabilities, you assign a strategy and that strategy has a counter strategy, right? And so you, you have to take the counter strategy. It, it does not allow you to step off the field and just say, okay, I think this guy's better than me, or I think I'm not as good as this person, or I think I don't have a lot of confidence today, so I'm not going to do this or that, right? If you're applying probabilities, then you have to make that move, and you're forgiven when it fails, so to speak. So that, I really believe, is why probabilistic rigor is one of the most important mental shifts that a poker player can undergo, and I think it'll pay you back enormous dividends in both your learning and in your, the quality of your play if you're actively trying to think this way and assigning probabilities to everybody. And of course, you're not going to be perfect. You're going to autopilot sometimes, and that's okay. You're, you're not going to apply probabilities. Even when you're consciously thinking, you're not always going to apply probabilities, and that's okay. But whenever you are consciously attendant, whenever you are paying attention, present, in the moment, try to start doing that. Try to start applying probabilities wherever you can. And I think it'll, you'll find for yourself that it's going to pay off enormously in the poker games that you're playing. Uh, so yeah, I think that's it. Um, is that it? That, that's it. That's all I really want to say on that. If you guys have any comments or any uh, criticisms, if you disagree or wanted to share your own insights, uh, leave a comment on my site or, or here or wherever. Uh, or send me an email, whatever, that works too. And... Uh, yeah, oh yeah, and the audiobook was, uh, I recently finished the audiobook. It came out, you can get it off Amazon.com, Audible.com, iTunes. Uh, so give it a download, it's pretty fucking cool. And um, I think that's it, yeah. So thanks guys for listening. I hope you got something out of this. Uh, this is Seed Qureshi, uh, signing out.